So uh, welcome everyone to the Cambridge Reproduction Forum, past, present and future of contraception. This forum has been co-organized by Cambridge Reproduction and the Cambridge Femtech Society. So Cambridge Reproduction is an interdisciplinary initiative at the University of Cambridge that brings together researchers from across all disciplines to study reproduction. Everything from science, medicine, technology to arts, humanities and social sciences. Membership is open to all staff and postgraduate students at the University of Cambridge and affiliated institutions. Um, and please see their website. Uh, we will uh, pop the link in the chat now for more information. Um, also, this um, event was organized by the Cambridge Femtech Society. We are a student and alumni society that aims to create a network of motivated individuals who want to promote knowledge sharing, tackle challenges in femtech that is the intersection between women's health and technology. And we really strive to give students and researchers the opportunity to meet key opinion leaders such as the one that we have today. These is entrepreneurs, investors and scientists uh, operating in femtech. So in this forum, we will explore the topic of contraception from a historical, sociological and scientific perspective. Um, and just some housekeeping before I pass on to Valentina to introduce our amazing speakers. Um, please keep your um, microphone on mute for the duration of the, of the event. There will be time for an open Q&A discussion at the end. Uh, if you have any questions in the meanwhile, please put them in the chat. We'll read them and uh, get back to those um, when it's uh, time. So uh, great, let's start. Uh, Valentina, over to you to introduce our speakers for today. So we, I'm very excited to uh, kick off this forum with the first part where we will focus on the past of contraception. And we will hear first uh, a presentation by Kim Alexander on why histories of contraception matter today. And Kim is a PhD student in the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of Cambridge. And she has long been fascinated by reproductive health. And in particular, her interests lie in reproductive technologies perceptions of fertility and gendered experiences in healthcare. The goal of her PhD, which she will partially be sharing with us today, is to construct the first large scale historiography of contraception. And then in the second part, of this first section of the forum, we will hear from Dr. Aprajita Sarkar on contraceptives in India, a history. Dr. Sarkar is, has a PhD uh, from the Department of History at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, and she's currently a postdoc in the Centre de Sciences Humaines in New, New Delhi in India, uh, where her work focuses on everyday governance of population in post-colonial India. She describes her work as being very interdisciplinary and requiring a combination of watching films, if not co-creating them, reading archival dust, talking to people, and triangulating how the three mount a multi-layered so uh, social reality. And she will also be joining the Laureate Center as a postdoctoral researcher fellow in July 2022. So over to you, Kim, to start your presentation. Right, so thank you very, very much for that introduction. Um, so yes, I am going to be talking to you today about the topic of my PhD, which is histories of contraception. And you will notice there the use of the plural histories, not history, because as I'm hoping I can convince you today, when it comes to the history of reproduction, as this has been written and read and broadcast and watched and generally communicated over the years, there's no such thing as one history of contraception. Throughout the 20th century and now into the 21st, a huge variety of authors have used history to frame discussion of contraception. And the sheer range and variety of these histories means, I think, that they have become as influential to understanding our current relationship with um, contraception as they have been to understanding how we make sense of the history of reproduction 
these are the stories we tell about contraceptive development and contraceptive innovation and the sorts of behaviours we should be encouraging and the sorts of behaviours we should maybe not be encouraging. So to hopefully convince you of that, I'm going to talk a little bit first about the background to this project and why I think histories of contraception are worth talking about. I'm then going to talk about the importance and why I think there might be a bit of a problem with the way we think about the history of contraception today. And then I'm going to close very briefly by just talking about my approach and what I hope to spend the next few years doing. But first, why histories of contraception? Well, quite apart from anything else, these things are everywhere. Um, I've taken a few examples here from literally the last couple of months, but believe me, uh, once you start looking for them, they crop up everywhere. You can see here we've got WebMD, Cosmopolitan, and Ella One is a brand of emergency contraceptive pill. And sometimes these histories like these ones are pretty positive about contraceptive history. They're pretty happy about um, contraceptive development. But this isn't always the case, and over the last couple of years in particular, we've seen a real growth in social media of people using history to express dissatisfaction with contraceptive development. I've got a couple of examples here, including a shameless screen grab from the Lowdown's own Instagram page, which is great, but a post comparing iPhone development with contraceptive development, and I think it's safe to say not being too happy about those two things, about how those two things compare. And then on the right, there's obviously a really important social and political strand to this. And we see a piece by the journalist Paula Akpan for Day, which is a period products manufacturer, talking about the anti-Black history of contraception. And it maybe doesn't come as a huge surprise that these are exactly the sort of debates we've been seeing in academia as well. Um, I only have a chance to give one example today, but for every narrative of revolutionary contraceptive development and the pill as a victory for women's rights, the last few years, the last few decades, in fact, have seen a real increase in social and political histories that have kind of complicated this narrative. I do only have time for one example today, but it is two absolute classics in the field. Um, on the left, we've got the medical history of contraception by the sociologist Norman E. Hines. This was first published in 1934. It was funded by the American Birth Control League, and it was enormously influential, and it still is. You will still see this history cited today. On the right, we have Women's Body, Women's Right by the US social historian Linda Gordon. She first published this in 1976, back when being a social historian itself was kind of quite a novel identity. And Gordon draws directly on Himes in this work, um, but where he speaks quite jubilantly of democratised knowledge of effective contraception and how great it is, she recovers quite a different history, one in which birth control is a bit more controlling, particularly if you happen to not be rich and white. And I think it's really important that we talk about this because, you know, despite these enormous intellectual disputes going on, and there, believe me when I say there are many others, the history of contraception plays a hugely important role in current contraceptive policy, and there doesn't seem to be any discussion of whether that should be the case. So I've got a couple of examples here from the UN and the WHO, both of whom use the distinction between traditional and modern contraceptives and to influence policy and to measure those policies' success. We see this way of thinking also in the West, where the number of us relying on older contraceptive technologies, so in practice, the pill and condoms, over modern long-acting reversible contraceptives, things like the quill and the implant, is presented as really quite problematic. There have been a number of not uncontroversial public health initiatives trying to encourage people to switch over onto more modern methods. And obviously there's some pretty interesting ethical implications of that, but there's also a really practical one which is that this distinction between traditional and modern contraceptives doesn't really reflect the realities of modern contraceptive development, where some of the newest, most innovative contraceptives that have come to market have been based on some of the oldest technologies we know. And an excellent example of this is natural cycles. And I know we're going to get a presentation about this later, so I won't say too much about it. But this came out in 2017. As you can see, it built itself as the first and only birth control app. It is essentially a digital fertility awareness based method. It uses an algorithm to determine the fertile period in the menstrual cycle. And this was and continues to be hugely controversial for every newspaper story declaring this revolutionary and wonderful. You get another one declaring it as quite a dangerous rehashing of old technology. And historians are not exempt from this either. The most recent uh, sort of largest scale history of contraception came out in 2020. It was by the historian Donna J. Drucker. And in that she does consider natural cycles, but she's very conflicted about where to place it in terms of contraceptive development. She kind of acknowledges on the one hand that the algorithm is new, but on the other that the science is old. 
And I flagged up this one quote from her in her conclusion where she sort of lumps natural cycles in with behavioral methods, including withdrawal and abstinence, and sort of warns in a way about these methods enduring in the present, despite being repackaged and with given new technological add-ons. And the reason I singled out this quote is because over 80 years earlier, we find almost exactly the same argument and the same warning in Heinz's history of contraception. Also talking about fertility awareness methods, um, here pinpointed by research into ovulation and menstrual cycle calendars that were coming out at the time. But Heinz, like Drucker, is very much not convinced by these developments. He sees them as modern embellishments that are sort of wrapping up ancient technologies and being a bit deceitful about it. And what I think is fascinating is that what neither of these authors do, and what, as far as I can see, that no one has really done, is ask why that's a problem. Why do we have an issue with this? Why do we expect innovative contraception to prevent conception in new ways? Basically, how did we get here? And well, that's where I'm hoping I come in. And um, the title of my PhD, as you can see here, is Contraceptive Stories, Historical Writing and Technological Innovation. And I'm planning on spending the next few years basically having a look at these histories of contraception and asking specifically. What, uh, practically, how have we used historical narratives to describe and promote and reject these contraceptive technologies? And two, a little bit more reflexively, how have these narratives we've established of change and continuity and development in contraceptive practice shaped the history of reproduction as we've come to understand it? Why do we have these assumptions of innovation, for example? And I am a first year, so I can't offer you much in terms of results yet, I'm afraid, uh, but I can offer you a hunch, or as I think I'm supposed to be calling it a hypothesis, which is here, um, which is that basically the pill has got a lot to answer for here. I think when it came onto the scene by suppressing ovulation, the pill kind of was this new science that people seem to be wanting. And as you can see here, I suspect that a focus on the pill as the benchmark of contraceptive innovation ever since has kind of cemented this distinction between traditional and modern contraceptives and possibly a lighted focus on other contraceptive developments. Since the pill, we've seen developments in barrier methods in particular, no matter how kind of effective or innovative they may be, kind of don't get the same attention. And I think if this is the case or something like this is the case, this might go some way to explaining one, why we have the current relationship with contraception we do today, but also why we sort of have this focus as historians, as people who write about contraception on the pill. And we don't consider things like the IUD and sterilization procedures as much, despite them being both more effective than the pill and also more widely used in a global context. But that is possibly me getting a little bit ahead of myself. So to return to a question that I sort of hope I can answer now, why do histories of contraception matter today? Well, one, they're everywhere, and I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. I think history really has entered our way of talking about contraception, which is interesting in and of itself. Uh, two, studying them can help us reassess some pretty major and some really quite important narratives, I think, in the history of reproduction. And three, they can also help us reevaluate our expectation of contraceptive technologies today. And if you come back in a few years' time, I'm hoping I can tell you exactly why. But until then, I will say thank you very, very much for listening. And uh, I have put my email there. I know we're going to do some questions later, but please do email me about this if you have any questions. I love talking about it. So I'd love to talk about it with you. Thank you. So let's start off with um, a sort of like a, a micro-ish history, because it's not really micro-history as a method of, of kind of some of the things that came discussed. Um, um, so as, as um, Kim started, uh, what I'm presenting is a history. There are several histories that can be written uh, of contraception in India and the role that it played in uh, its national development, in its political trajectory, in its social history. There are, there are way, I mean, there are so many that have been written and there are so many histories that still need to be written. So here's uh, some of the things that I'm gonna quickly talk about. And if I'm running out of time, I'll just rush through them. Um, so some of the strongest themes that I figured out were the frenzy to search for contraception uh, emboldened lots of um, craziness around um, the, the, the 
the way we talk about uh, family planning and, and the solutions that family planning was supposed to reach. So family planning from the 50s onwards was seen as a way of uh, resolving um, the question of poverty. Uh, and for a post-colonial nation immediately, um, just you can just say uh, like 1947 is when uh, India got independence as many people might know already, but uh, you can say that the idea of decolonization was sort of around from late 1920s, late uh, 1930s, and um, along with that was the, was this this tra uh, was this fascination with population control and uh, the scientific uh, emergence of ideas of uh, whether a small family size can effectively bring about economic development. And this was a global phenomenon. We can talk about that uh, and the historiography around that later. Uh, so demographic transition theory is a kind of um, population study that first started bookending things um, like contraception, things like the family planning movement. It is seen as a movement because of the conviction with which it traveled in the world. Um, it was not only supposed to solve uh, poverty, but demographic transition is essentially pushing populations that were um, Im immobile, malnourished, and colonized towards a post-colonial future, which was self-developed, self-sufficient, and um, the opposite of colonized. So the demographic transition theory was not just about fertility decline. It wasn't just about uh, how small family size could in, um, would mean more a better standard of living for individual families. It was about emboldening a nation and bringing them out of um, the way they saw themselves, which was uh, basically former colonies. Um, family size effectively becomes a, a site of coercion and desire because the immediacy of trying to reach certain kinds of birth rates, trying to reach certain targets of uh, birth rates uh, meant that the state continuously tried to propagate and um, push people towards a certain family size. And this push uh, became more um, stringent by 1960s, by late 1960s to 70s. And yet, what was also evident was that family size and, um, and, and, and popular culture began talking to each other. Uh, the idea of contraception or the use of contraception was not just a scientific discourse, was not just a medical discourse, it also interacted with popular culture. So these are some of my, um, uh, this is one of the ways, um, so yeah, this is one of the ways in which you can see annual reports of the time uh, talk about family planning acceptance. Um, I'm not gonna read the entire uh, paragraph, but it's essentially talking about how the Indian family planning program is directed to as uh, towards one seventh of humanity. And so, and, all, and you're doing a wide favor to this humanity, to this large scale humanity by giving them all kinds of contraceptive methods through service centers, distributive channels, schemes, plans, inputs. And, and you are therefore uh, helping a highly diversified population meaningfully and effectively. Now this particular paragraph is from an annual report that Ford Foundation released in 1969, but it could be literally any paragraph written in any part of, um, in any, uh, from 1950 to 1970, the kind of uh, reports that were coming out of the India experiment by Ford Foundation was um, was basically always replete with vocabulary around uh, schemes, distribution channels, plans, inputs, to the point that even the women who appear to use contraception would be seen as sites of experiment or like channels of um, usage. And, and this kind of vocabulary, uh, in a way, uh, sort of modeled citizens as, 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 as just models of you know, using contraception and not really human beings after a while. So that became a problem. And uh, this is one um, report from the Ford Foundation, which sort of tracks the use of um, 
sterilizations and contraception from 1965 to 1970. Um, so that's on the uh, x-axis, uh, on the y-axis, you see the thousands of people who would have accepted it. Um, the dotted line is IUCD, which is what we know as intrauterine device now. And um, sterilizations is a thick, bold line. And uh, contraceptive acceptors is the average of the two. And you will notice that the thick, bold line sort of begins somewhere between 1968, uh, in between 1968, is because that is between in between 1968, somewhere between August and September, was when the first uh, mass um, packaging of condoms began. So the first nationalized condoms in India were, were, were marketed. Uh, it's called Nirodh. It's basically a Sanskrit word for, for stopping um, something. So yeah, stopping. And uh, so that's why that line begins somewhere in the middle of 1968 and continues forth. Um, you will see also that in literally towards the end of each year, you see a little spike going up in sterilizations and in IUD usage, but more in sterilizations. Is, that is because at the end of each of these years, you had these camps where um, certain number of people in certain populations, the subaltern population majorly, uh, were um, invited to these camps, these mobile camps where um, they were asked to uh, get sterilized and get uh, monetary compensation or some kind of reward. And so the numbers would sort of increase for that year in that particular month. And this is a very interesting trend because I will show it later. Um, how, uh, and it just shows how sterilizations have been increasingly, like they have been consistently popular in the Indian family planning program. There have been IUDs, there have been condoms and their usage has been high, but nothing has beaten sterilizations as the main mode of um, reducing family size. Um, this is basically reaffirming what I just said in the previous slide that um, vasectomies were 55% uh, of um, the kind of um, uh, family planning usage in, in 1967, 68. That changes a little bit in 68, 69. This, remember this graph because this changes in the 1980s and that it, there is a history to that. Um, you also three, see 3.5% 3 of people using foam tablets, jellies, creams, diaphragms. We can quickly go into a history of why the state slowly sort of moved away from these kind of contraceptive forms, which were very popular with Planned Parenthood and moved towards condoms and IUDs as the funding pattern changed. Uh, from not that Planned Parenthood wasn't invested in India, but as Ford Foundation came in more uh, dramatically in India, um, the stress of the program changed and, uh, and, and the kind of contraceptives that were being dispersed also changed. Uh, these are some of the uh, loops that were available, the LIPS loops. Um, the, the, uh, there's an interesting discussion in the paper trail about how the um, intellectual property rights, as we know it, were sort of with Ford Foundation, but um, so therefore no one could really replicate it in India, even though they were perfectly replicable. But Ford Foundation kind of didn't trust Indian ph pharmaceutical companies to come up with like reliable ones. So they would be brought from the US or uh, some other um, country nearby. It, it's a bit complicated. Anyway, so these were the kind of um, coils that were available. Um, which were circulating in the Indian market. Um, uh, on the left um, is a very interesting report that I um, got from the fam uh, family planning newsletter um, it, from, like, uh, from the Department of Family Planning in India, uh, which, is, which doesn't exist anymore. And it's, it's basically, uh, the report was about tubectomy camps. And... Um, and, and it sort of was very proudly saying that there were some 5,000 tribal women who went through tubectomies and, and uh, yeah, they were very proud about it. And I found this photograph particularly interesting because of the way uh, they're sitting. I actually, it's very, I, in terms of government sources, it's so hard to find 
paper trail which actually shows and forget talking but actually shows uh, the women who did get sterilized so here is one photograph which sort of does show women line up and and accept sterilization you see papers in their hand which means there's some kind of ethical um guidelines being taken um taken uh, or considered but um apart from this photograph i uh, there are very few times that you see uh, a, a sort of documentation of the actual women who uh, went through sterilization process and on the right hand you see a very typical advertisement that were uh, sort of uh, contemporary or, or like contemporaneous to the kind of sterilization camp that you see both are from 1967 so you see the mother and child um, sort of um, symbolism that's going on there and you're supposed to just walk into the nearest family planning center and get the loop and be the you know modern woman but also traditional but also happy the stress is on uh, being happy so obviously the coding of happiness here um, what is interesting is uh, also the pedagogic impulse of contraception. You're not just telling women how to reduce families, you're also teaching her how to be a good mother, uh, how to look after children, how to make, uh, how to actually make better citizens, how to have um, healthier children. So all of them are carrying one child in front of them, as you can see from the photograph. And there is also the social worker who is teaching through posters, through um, other mechanisms on how to be better mothers. We can talk about this later also. Um, I just wanna also talk about the paper trailer about how Muslim families, which are uh, even today, there is this whole discussion in Indian political scenario, but the right wing scenario about how Muslim families are large and they don't accept uh, contraception. And I just wanna quickly say that in my paper trail, I did not find any organized resistance to contraception from large Muslim families. In fact, what you see here is the religious head of a prominent um, um, sect of Islam uh, sort of talking about family planning to a whole lot of young, presumably Muslim men, because they are sitting in front of a masjid and yeah, talk and, and essentially advocating for family planning. So this is just one example though, where we can talk a lot about that also. Um, again, talking about the free sterilization facilities and how um, this little ad shows how uh, all the hospitals um, were sort of um, encouraged to give uh, to to operate on people and um, and and not just operate, also give out cash benefits, which are sort of mentioned at the end of the ad of uh, a, a little uh, uh, females. Interestingly, women getting uh, ten rupees more than men for each case of sterilization. So um, material benefits were part of sterilization and they continue to be uh, part of the kind of um, surgeries that happen even today. Uh, this is a typical uh, advertisement for uh, Nirodh, like I mentioned, the mass uh, produced condom, the first mass produced condom in India, it's still available. It's about a woman, man who is telling his best friend, you know, you need to be better, you need to be smarter, you need to be a better husband because, well, you know, you, you, your wife needs to be happy and you need to, well, you can be, you can do all of this with a condom. And you can see at the back, there is a older girl and there is a, there is a younger child and we can presume it to be a boy because that is how most of the coding around advertisements was. It was uh, the nuclear family or the two child family was essentially heterosexual, but also uh, one, one daughter, one son sort of um, also taking into accept acceptance the fact that the, the 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 male inheritance has to be uh, taken into account even in this modern nuclear family. And these are some of the ways in which contraception actually enters popular culture. This, there is this essential awareness of how a small family can do better in terms of financial needs, how the woman has uh, on the left, in the middle, you'll see an advertisement about how the woman can do better in terms of having more leisure, um, and more space to herself. There's a there's a transistor at the back. There's a painting on the wall. She's just sitting and reading a newspaper. Something that so idyllic that a working class or a subaltern woman could possibly never even think about. And on the right, you see a conjugal couple sort of 
uh, get married around the concept of a home. And again, the stresses on conjugality and a certain kind of marriage formation, which seems uh, extremely grounded in the material reality of becoming modern. So jumping to 1998 and almost coming to the end of the talk, uh, if you remember, I showed you a graph of like um, how uh, contraceptives looked like from 67 to 68. You, if you remember, it was about 58% male vasectomy. But now you'll see that 52% of the population in 1998 was not using any kind of uh, contraception at all. And the most popular form of uh, 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 family planning was female sterilization at 34%. So what happened? Um, there was a period of 75 to 77 where the government, uh, uh, democracy was suspended, it's called the emergency years, where forced sterilizations were officially taking place. And uh, most of them were on, were politically very, uh, very uh, dense. And so when the government fell, uh, it was on the basis, one of the, one of the uh, questions on which the government fell was on, was, was on the fact that there was uh, forced sterilizations going on. And uh, Ford Foundation didn't want to have anything to do with it. Population Council didn't want to have anything to do with it. There's enough literature on that. So I'm just going to talk about it very simply. But there's emer the emergency period in India, plus the one-child family in, in, in um, China, uh, both of them sort of were coterminous in the way they came together in the mid-1970s. And that is when the shift happened uh, in terms of the global vocabulary around family planning and contraception. Um, the stress was uh, less on population control as a direct uh, measure of, uh, of poverty. And um, the vocabulary and the advocacy changed in its pattern and it became more about uh, family welfare uh, and women and maternal health rather than just family planning. In fact, the Department of Family Planning in India was dissolved to be replaced by Ministry of Family Health and Family Welfare. Um, but what has become a standard pattern since then is this overall reliance on female sterilization. And a very, and a very um, in my opinion, a very dangerous pattern of not using either, no con of, of no use of contraception and very, very um, reductive uses of let's say withdrawal or rhythm method. And why I call it re re um, reductive is because it's all of these methods are still dependent on the women uh, having to sort of push for the decision to limit the family size. It, none of these um, methods, except maybe the condom, seem to rely on any of the kind of consensual uh, 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 talk or the, or the kind of discussion around family planning that was first part of family planning advocacy in the 1950s. Remember the uh, posters about uh, counseling and social worker and the women and, and becoming better mothers and all that. So all those kind of uh, discussions seem to be uh, out of the picture now. It's, it's essentially about uh, sterilizations. So therefore, uh, right now, you'll see a whole lot of cases of uh, uterus removal or of how uh, women are essentially, uh, be and their reproductive ca capacities of certain subaltern women seem to be constantly on the, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, um, on, on um, real dangerous lines here in the way that they are um, uh, always on, on target. And so something, uh, uh, even though um, forced sterilizations uh, came under a scanner in the 1970s, 75 to 77, from the 1980s, something very different happened. So even though the, the program itself changed towards family welfare and maternal health, um, on ground, uh, if women of a certain, or sub, uh, if uh, Muslim uh, uh, oppressed caste women were to walk into a primary health center and ask for contraception, she might push, be, still be pushed and encouraged to take up long-term sterilization instead because the assumption is she won't have the time, she won't have the knowledge and she won't remember to take her pills or she won't know when the IUD would slip out. So what is this assumption and how does this work? And these are some of the other slides that I had on trying to show how uh, and essentially, 
uh, these discourses on India depopulating or, or the fertility declining is happening on the basis of um, uh, uh, female sterilization in India. Thank you. And so we thank again, uh, Kim and Afrajita and move on to the next uh, session where we will have uh, three presentations. So let, let's try to, <laughs> to stick to time so that we don't run over too much. And the first one uh, will be by Alice Pelton, uh, who will talk about the company that she founded, which is the Lowdown, a contraceptive review platform and community. Alice uh, founded the, the Lowdown, which is the first the world's first review platform for contraception in 2019. And she set up the platform after struggling with the side effects from the pill as a teenager herself. And now at the low, the lowdown, they are on a mission to help make contraception easier to choose and to access. They have collected over 5,000 reviews on every contraceptive method and brand that is currently available in the UK. And they have recently launched an expert consultation and prescription service. So we're very excited to hear from you, Alice. And then we will have a presentation um, by Professor Cara DeLay, uh, tuning in from the US, uh, who will be talking about moving oral contraceptives over the counter in the American South. And Professor Cara DeLay, she is um, currently uh, doing her research and um, at the um, College of Charleston in the US, and her research analyzes women, gender, culture in Ireland, the American South, and the Atlantic world with a focus on the history of reproduction. She has authored uh, three books and over 30 peer reviewed uh, journal articles and book chapters, and she has two new books and projects coming up. One is in collaboration and co-authored by uh, Beth Sandstrom, which I believe is uh, on the call today as well, which is called uh, Catching Fire, Women's Health Activism in Ireland. And the other one is Menstruation, a Global History. Uh, professor Beth Sandstrom is an Associate Professor of Communication and Public Health at the College of Charleston in the US, where she is the director of the Women's Health Research Team and the recipient of the 2018 uh, William Moore Distinguished Teacher Scholar Award. She conducts applied research that informs the development of community-based public health interventions and nationally recognized communication campaigns. She is also a Fulbright US scholar, uh, research grant recipient, and leading expert on health communication, social marketing, and women's health. And finally, we will hear from Stephanie Felsberger on her uh, PhD thesis as well, which is on data flows, period trackers, and or as contraception. And Stephanie is a PhD student at the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge, and her research focuses on fertility tracking applications. And specifically, um, she's investigating and asking how women in Egypt and Austria navigate the commodification of personal data to, questions, uh, to question conceptions of gender and label in surveillance capitalism, data ownership, and commodification. And her background is in political sciences and Arabic studies at the University of uh, Vienna. And before embarking her PhD, she has worked as a Bartlett Fellow at the Access to Knowledge for Development Center at the Un American University in Cairo. And so we're very excited to hear from all three of our speakers. And I will now hand it over to you, Alice, to share your screen and start your presentation. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, and yeah, great to see so many people I know here. Really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Alice and I sat, set up a company called The Lowdown. Uh, and our mission is to basically transform the minefield that is contraception that over a billion people have to think about for on average 30 years in their lifetime. Uh, so I'll, I'm just going to do quite a short presentation just to talk through um, yeah, a bit about us, um, my journey and why I started the lowdown. So yeah, like I said, contraception is one of these products that we all need, um, but it's, um, it's not, that, oh, you can't see yourselves, can you? No? Okay, no, it's all good. We can see the presentation. There's nothing weirder than watching yourself watching a presentation. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, some of the other presentations have touched on this, but 
about one in three people don't really like the contraception they're using. Um, and I, you know, I did a talk which um, Kim uh, was, was at, which talked about the huge lack of innovation there is um, and just how mental it is really that we can put a man on the moon, but we can't invent something that prevents pregnancy that people actually like. Um, I was, you know, one of these people. Um, I started taking the pill when I was 16. It basically made me crazy. Uh, and I didn't realize for a few years um, that I, it really caused me incredible problems with my mental health. I think I almost got sacked from my first job out of university for being unprofessional um, because I cried so much. Uh, and I just realized that it is just a, absolutely horrible when you're on the wrong contraception and that these hormones are, can do amazing things, but they can also do really detrimental things to your mental health. So I figured, um, gosh, this is something I've spent 10 years struggling with. Um, and then I spoke to lots of my friends and realized that they've struggled with it too. Um, and I kind of started to unpick um, what are the problems in contraception, uh, mainly with the UK lens, but many of these problems are, are across the world. So one is that there's a massive lack of data on the side effects. There isn't that much clinical evidence because no one really cares about funding research into women's health. Um, and it's really hard to know, you know, okay, if I got this on this pill, will I feel the same on this? Um, yeah, what's the right coil for me? Uh, and resorting to Google, I found that most of the information on the internet was either Cosmopolitan articles or the NHS website. And there wasn't really much in the middle. And I figured that, you know, there's a huge gap for high quality information and data. The second problem I had was I was very frustrated that speaking to my very old family GP, um, the medical advice I received was pretty mediocre. Um, and I discovered that uh, and I'm not bashing GPs because they obviously do incredible work on incredible uh, tight, you know, timeframes and budgets. Um, but they they don't have a huge amount of training on contraception, even though they prescribe most of it in the UK. Um, and the number of doctors who've got their diploma in sexual health or that really understand the specifics and all the complexity in contraception is diminishing. And the final problem was even in the UK, uh, one third of women can't get hold of contraception from where they want to, thanks to kind of rel relentless budget cuts and sexual health. Um, yeah, it's still really hard to kind of get the pill you want or get even just get that GP appointment. So I, um, I built a website um, and part of it was to start to solve this problem. It's called The Lowdown. Um, you can find us at thelowdown.com. Um, and basically, we have a really unique data set of over 5,000 contraception reviews for every method and brand of contraception in the UK. We've got some fantastic tools which help you find your match. Um, we've also got a missed pill calculator. So if you missed your pill, you don't have to try and decipher like a really complicated patient information leaflet. You can just fill in our little form and we'll tell you what you should probably think about doing next. We've also hired some amazing, friendly, lovely GPs who really know their stuff. And you can book in to speak to them for 20 minutes, which is something I wish I'd had when I was 16. And finally, we've launched a private prescription service. Um, unfortunately, uh, integrating with the NHS is a very long, arduous path. Um, but, you know, there are women who prefer to pay to get their prescription delivered to their door without having to, you know, try and get a GP appointment. So we currently stock the widest range of contraceptives, including the patch, the injection, the ring. Um, and yeah, I'm just, it's part of us trying to make this easier and more convenient for women. Um, just a few stats that we're finding from our review data. So you probably don't need me to tell you that the pill is probably not the solution. Um, we're seeing that women are most satisfied on the coils, especially the hormonal coil. That's currently our sort of, you know, top of the league table. Um, and I think that's something that is such a shame in a, in a way, because the amount of people that can fit coils or remove them has, has really reduced in this country. Um, we also have a really detailed view of what the side effects are. And some people might think, oh gosh, anecdotal data, isn't that a bit unreliable? Well, actually we've, we've just spent, you know, as, as a world, two years self-reporting symptoms of COVID and it turns out that that's pretty helpful so the lowdown sort of like that but for contraception and we collect loads of information on you know what, what women have experienced um, from using every method um, and then the saddest thing is that I'm not alone it's not just me the pill doesn't just make me a little bit um, upset um, the impact on mood is, is really coming out very strongly 
Um, and there's so much more research that needs to be done into um, done into this. So I really hope that our data set can help be at the forefront of pushing forward that much needed conversation. So I'm going to wrap up there so it's not too long. Um, I'd love it if you could follow us at Get The Lowdown. If you want to chat or tell me what we can do better or tell me what we've done badly, um, that's my email. Um, and yeah, great to speak to you all. Thank you. So Kara and I work together on the women's health research team at the College of Charleston. And we are a group of about 25 undergraduate students um, and about 10 active faculty members who come from all across campus to conduct innovative interdisciplinary research in collaboration with community partners and to use our findings to advocate to improve the lives of women, girls, and gender expansive people in our community and beyond. And so really this study, uh, looking at moving oral contraceptives over the counter, um, the Women's Health Research Team is an organizational member of IBIS Reproductive Health's um, Oral Contraceptive Over the Counter Working Group. And so one of the uh, real calls for researchers from that group was to conduct research um, with a number of different populations and, um, and really to, to center um, those voices that we don't hear from very much. Um, and so that's really where the idea for this study came from. Uh, now, I believe the pill is available over the counter where, where you all are, where many of you are. Um, so you might be saying, why is this important? Um, well, here in the United States, um, we have a lot of challenges accessing contraception as some of you have talked about earlier today. Um, and the American College of Obstetrics Obstetricians and gynecologists recommends that oral contraceptives should be available over the counter. Um, and both ACOG and the World Health Organization agree that an annual exam or cervical cancer screening even should not be a barrier to access a contraceptive prescription. So the pill is already available over the counter in over 100 countries, and it's as safe as other methods that we get over the counter, just like ibuprofen. Okay. Thank you. So I won't belabor the point, but it is safe. Um, and the other thing is that uh, there are so few uh, contraindications, um, but research really suggests that there's no significant difference between clinician and patient identification of contraindications. So what does that mean? It means that women are fully capable of identifying contraindications for themselves, um, and they don't even need a healthcare provider to help them with that. So the impetus for this study really was the understanding that initial marketing campaigns introducing innovations to consumers frame products and services in ways that persist over time and impact the audience's long-term understanding and uptake of innovations. So here in the United States, we sort of have this one chance, this unique opportunity to introduce oral contraception over the counter in ways that resonate with the audience's needs and values. And we, for much of our work, we use a reproductive justice framework. Um, and so that provided the conceptual lens for study design, data collection, and analysis. And I'm sure many of you know about reproductive justice. This was a framework and a movement coined by Black women in the United States. And reproductive justice champions the right to determine if, when, and how to have children. So just to give you a, a, a brief visual explanation of this framework, um, women's reproductive health and right to bodily autonomy is impacted by these intersections of systemic oppressions. So if you think about racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, and ableism, um, which shape women's stratified economic, environmental, social, political, and physical positions. So using a reproductive justice approach really facilitates a comprehensive and situated understanding of the factors that contribute to women's health. 
So we conducted a formative audience research um, study that Kara is going to tell you a little bit about our findings. But really, our goal here was to provide recommendations for campaign planners to introduce OCOTC to potential consumers in ways that resonate with their needs and values. And I think importantly, to avoid stigmatizing marginalized communities, because some of our traditional approaches to communication, um, especially when we're trying to be culturally sensitive, um, um, we end up really further stigmatizing communities where we're not listening to their voices. Um, and so we wanted to take to move beyond culturally sensitive communication to really a culture centered approach. So this study took place in South Carolina, and even though in the United States overall, um, we are at about 50% unintended pregnancy, um, here in South Carolina, um, we're, not, we're not even meeting that, that national benchmark. And so um, we recruited women from five rural counties here in our state based on an analysis of things like Medicaid coverage, um, cost, availability of services, waiting times, um, clinic hours, and we found through this analysis that there were approximately 23,000 women in these areas that were in need of contraceptive services and supplies. So we recruited 52 uh, women to complete in-depth qualitative interviews. We used theoretical sampling to improve maximum variation based on factors relevant to reproductive justice, um, such as race, ethnicity, and income, et cetera. Uh, and we recorded and transcribed those. We had a, a small participant incentive, and we used a qualitative data analysis software to code and organize the data. Um, and happy to answer any questions about that, but I know we're limited on time, so I'll I'll turn it over to Kara to talk more about our findings. Um, so very quickly, I'll talk about um, some of our findings from the study. So the first thing to note is that um, the women we interviewed want greater access to contraception. They need greater access to contraception. And it, most of them were in favor of moving OCs, OTC. Um, so they were very much interested in greater access to contraception. And we'll talk about some of these things specifically. So first thing that they um, were interested in was the issue of convenience. So um, getting a medication over the counter like other medications. Um, and they also recognized that OCOTC would be good because it would decrease their costs and not necessarily just the cost of the medication, but the cost of um, a doctor's visit, which often of course requires a copay here in the United States. They also recognized um, some things that we didn't quite necessarily expect when we did this study, which is that um, doctors in this particular part of the country, um, or pharmacists sometimes have religious reasons to not um, give women contraception. So OC, OTC would help alleviate this. And they also talked about something called the waiting room stigma. And you can see from this quote here that a lot of these women um, live in small towns. And so they felt that, you know, everyone goes to the same doctors. And when you see people in the waiting rooms, um, there is maybe a stigma with people watching each other to see who's accessing contraception and why. So a lot of our, in, our um, interviewees also did express concerns about moving OCOTC. Um, and so a lot of the older women stressed that they were a little uneasy about adolescent women, teenagers, accessing this medication, using it improperly, and even um, you know, abusing it. So they felt that maybe there should be provider involvement for, those, for that population. Other women were concerned about side effects, contraindications, um, and you know, they did articulate that they felt that the pill was a more serious medication than other over-the-counter medications, and they were very entrenched in this notion of medical authority that it should be a physician in particular that prescribes this medication. But overall, you know, what our study showed and what we argue is that OC, OTC must be accessible. This will help empower women in the communities we study, which are overwhelmingly African-American. So we had over 60% African-American women in this study um, and in rural areas and often um, impoverished areas. OC, um, OC, OTC is safe. Um, the pill is safer than many other over-the-counter medications, easy to use. And as we develop an eff effective communication strategy, we should emphasize the benefits of OC, OTC for these specific communities, um, things that we talked about, anonymity, 
convenience, decreased out-of-pocket costs, reducing the very, very high rates of unintended in teenage pregnancies. But we also must not overlook or dismiss women's concerns. We have to address them directly by highlighting um, the benefits, um, but also then um, looking at and addressing their concerns. So we need to educate people about um, side effects, contraindications, et cetera. We need to offer them choices so they can still obtain physician guidance and examinations and screenings when desired. Um, so we believe that OCOTC provides an additional option for rural women to access contraception and that this will help them um, be empowered and supported. So rural women, women of color, and low-income women face exacerbated barriers to accessing the pill and other forms of contraception. So initial marketing really needs to center, center these women's concerns, um, highlight findings that promote the benefits, and address um, concerns directly. What can we all do? What can physicians do? What can scholars do? What can advocates do? We can trust women and we can listen to women and all people who can become pregnant. Um, so, you know, it's a lack of knowledge and misinformation that sometimes can contribute to barriers. Um, and so we ended the study by thinking about the future, you know, how can we improve knowledge and build resilience against misinformation about OC? So we'd love to answer some questions. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone. I hope everyone's has some energy to listen. I'll try to keep it brief and snappy. Uh, just a quick reminder, I'm talking today about period trackers and contraception. My name is Steph. I'm at the Centre for Gender Studies and I'm a third year PhD student. And here are my contacts. I'll pop them up, uh, pop them in the chat later as well. If anyone wants to have a chat around menstruation, contraception, surveillance, please, please get in touch. A quick overview over what I want to talk about today. I'll talk, I'll start with looking at my angle from which I'm just looking at uh, period trackers. And then my second part, I'll link period trackers to different contraceptive habits um, as they've come up in the conversation with my research participants. And in the end, if there's still time, I'll talk a bit about the difference between licensed and unlicensed period trackers, which would be natural cycles, which you've already been introduced to in an earlier talk. So my background personally is in studying like big tech, surveillance and data commodification. And for my PhD, I'm very interested to understanding um, how we conceptualize kind of our role of users in the digital economy, because we spend this much time creating data that is really valuable that then becomes commodified by these big um, tech companies. And I chose to look at period track tracking apps because they're one of the most and largest, like fastest growing sectors in like femtech industry, but also amongst like wearable tech and the self tracking sector, women's health and menstruation uh, tracking apps are really, really popular. Um, this is a quick um, overview. I hope you can see the side of it as well. A uh, quick overview over the data that these apps either ask you to track as a user or that they track in the background. Um, and on the right side, there's a bit of visualization on who could access this kind of information. And it includes everything from um, other big tech companies, big advertisers, your employers, um, insurance companies, um, governments, marketing agencies. So you can see that um, there's a lot of data and a lot of very private information that gets um, you know, gathered by these apps and the, the places that they can be shared with are, can also really have uh, quite a severe uh, effect uh, or a consequence for the, the people whose data gets shared. And the question is, what do people get in return for sharing their, their data and for tracking. Well, the first thing, and this is also what I'll talk about later, like the main purpose for which people use these apps is to kind of have a record of their period data. So like the very common thing, you go to the gynecologist and they ask you when it's your last period and then you have a record. Um, the other thing in terms of information that these apps provide is rather limited. So you will only receive information on the timing of your period and possibly also a prediction of that uh, period as well as the window of fertility and sometimes PMS and this is where um, the apps come in when it comes to different contraceptive contraceptive methods um, and this is the last bit of why these apps are so um, yeah so interesting to look at because they have access 
to this kind of information of whether somebody is pregnant or not. And data of pregnant uh, women or people becoming pregnant is like really, really valuable to advertisers because of how they think consumption, consumption patterns work. So I don't know if you can see it, it's an average data, uh, an average person's data is worth 10 cents and a pregnant woman's would be $1.50. Um, and so this is a quick uh, screen grab of uh, the different period trackers that are available. They're all designed for different purposes. Um, to become pregnant, to avoid pregnancy, they're designed for different target groups. But there's one distinction that is quite important, and that's whether an app is licensed or whether it's not. Because most of these apps, and when I say most, I really, really mean the vast majority of these apps are not in any sense of the way like approved by the FDA or any other like government licensing uh, institution that would qualify them as like an actual contraceptive method. Most of these are developed, they are developed with, you know, health officials, but it's up to everyone to kind of decide and like figure out how trustworthy all of these apps are. And they're also the way that they predict and the way that they work is very different if they are a licensed app that works as um, that works as a contraceptive method or whether it's just a period tracker. And that's really important because all like all trackers. And so if your app is more like a Fitbit for your period, it also means that like all wearable health, like Fitbit, all these kind of like self-tracking apps, they're very specific in the fine print um, that none of their data that they gather, they're not responsible for the medical accuracy of it. They are, I think Fitbit was sued by somebody who said, oh, your uh, heart rate data was inaccurate. And then uh, Fitbit was like very, very specific on the fact that they never promised any any accuracy so it's quite an interesting um like spectrum on which these apps uh, exist and i'll talk a bit about how people use them and what purpose they're using them for so um the insights are based on like field work that i did in austria last year uh, so that was um lockdown uh lockdown research so it was a lot of zoom interviews i talked to uh, around 30 uh, different people from like an hour to two hours in like semi-structured qualitative interviews. And so the people I talked to, they were very similar and very different in very different aspects. So most of them were white women that were um, very well educated from like an upper middle class background, um, but they were very diverse when it comes to their gender identity and sexual um, orientation. So I've had, I've talked to um, cis women, I've talked to trans uh, people, some people identified as non-binary and also when it comes to their sexual orientation, there was a very wide spectrum. So it's a quite interesting, but also narrow snapshot into the users of these apps. Um, and, but all of them made very, or tried very hard to make kind of like the right choices around the period products that they bought, um, the kinds of apps that they chose and also what kind of like choices they made when it came to like contraception and reproduction. Um, all right, so what's the purpose that people use these apps for? And um, like I said, the main purpose for most people um, was to kind of keep a record and a track, like keep track of their period in like a way that was very useful, that was very convenient and that was very easy and like an app on your phone will definitely satisfy all of those needs. Um, lots of people also needed just a reminder for when their period was due. So say your cycle is very easy, you don't have any PMS, you don't have any pain. Um, they would just use the app to like give them a reminder so that they would have their cup with them or something like that. Um, some people would use these apps to like try to avoid becoming pregnant. Um, I'll talk a bit about that later. Some also would try to like become pregnant with the help of these apps. So they would try to like figure out um they're the window of ovulation and then um yeah use use these apps uh, to do that others would simply try to understand their cycle better and that would also differ whether it didn't matter like some people would have a very very regular cycle no like suspicion of any like endometriosis or pcos or any complications but they just wanted to like engage with their cycle and would use the the period tracker as a tool to, to do that um, others were trying to figure out correlations between the period and their mental health or other like medical issues that they had. 
Um, and some would also just use the period tracker as like a diary and put in dreams and other things. Um, and so how are contraceptive choices and attitudes towards them related to um, using a period tracker? Well, I think what's been said um, repeatedly that people, people are very, very unhappy very often with the contraceptive especially hormonal options that they have was really evident also in the conversations that I've had with people. I've had very many uh, conversations about for people coming off the pill of having a more or less terrible experience uh, and then we're using the app to get a better understanding of their cycle and they would do this as like as part of a conscious engagement with um, with menstruation as opposed to they would look at the taking the pill more as like a like a band-aid where you're managing it and like it's also muted but they would make a conscious choice of like going off the pill and like trying to like fully understand the cycle as it would as it would evolve and others would use it as part of the contraceptive uh, methods uh, predominantly they would for example use the regular barrier method but would kind of use like some of the non-licensed period apps to just know when they had to be more careful as as they would describe it in in conversations um others would also um they were for example it started um a UT, iud or an implant and it really threw off their cycle so they were trying to figure out what was going on and they were tracking the the symptoms um and like different different side effects and they would also use the apps to kind of manage how they would con like how they would talk to their doctors because of very often when they've had a track like evidence of like irregular cycles or pain they would it would kind of self sort sorry serve as evidence in their conversations with with doctors and uh, I know I'm going a little bit over time but just very briefly I'll talk a bit about clue uh, natural cycles because it was already mentioned so. Natural cycles is interesting because it is one of the few that is licensed um, and it uses basically the family natural family tracking method where you measure your temperature every morning and then the app will tell you which days you're um, on which days you're uh, fertile and which not so you'd have to use a condom on, on those days and this app is quite interesting because it in the way that it's tested and the way that it's registered um, in its own like internal documents they're quite clear that this is an app for people who have a very regular cycle a very regular lifestyle and for people who also wouldn't mind becoming pregnant in the next few years but in its advertisement this app is very different because it tries to catch it tries to present itself as like the non-hormonal healthcare uh, like contraceptive option that works very well that works all the time so there's a bit of a mismatch of um, expectations and reality that has had some um yeah dramatic or like unintended consequences for users um i think i'll leave it there i'm happy to talk a bit more about like the actual um i have a bit more about clue um but yeah and maybe if there are some questions i can do that because you see i'm at 11 minutes our next uh two speakers which are uh, for, we, we have had planned for the session about the future of uh, contraception, are both from uh, the same company that was recently founded called Dama Health. And they are uh, Elena Reda and uh, Dr. Aaron uh, Lanzerwitz. And their talk will be on leveraging precision medicine to personalize contraception, which is indeed um, what Dama Health is all about. So just a little bit about, um, their backgrounds. Uh, Elena has a background in biomedical sciences and epigenetics, and then she went on to obtain her master's degree in innovation, entrepreneurship and management from Imperial College in London. She has then worked in business operations, consulting and project management in several companies. And uh, because she has been long fascinated by healthcare startup ecosystem. She has also worked with multiple health tech startups in the fields of clinical trial recruitment systems, drug formulations, and fertility. And currently, she is a freelance copywriter and the co founder and CEO of Dama Health, which is a femtech company focused on offering women and clinicians personalized contraception recommendations through uh, screening tests and pharmacogenetics, which 
is what they will be talking um, about to us today. And then uh, a few words also about Dr. R. Lazarowitz, uh, who is currently in the US. So also thank you very much for uh, joining us in this weird time of the day for you. Um, he is uh, board certified in obstetric and uh, gynecology. And um, I think his background is extremely interesting. He holds a, a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Johns Hopkins University in the US, and then he went on to medical school uh, at Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, in Texas, and then moved to Colorado for his residency, where he also um, obtained a fellowship in family planning and a master's in clinical science. And so he is uh, clearly a practitioner and he uh, is going to have clinical duties in <laughs> a few minutes, but he also spends a large portion of his time doing research and particularly he is interested in better understanding how genetic differences influence hormonal contraception. And that's why it was a clear um, application and translation of his research to uh, co-fund um, Dama Health together with Elena. So I'm now going to hand it over to both Elena and Aaron to uh, share the screen and present their fantastic work. Well, yes, good afternoon, everyone, um, and really excited to be here today amongst all the other amazing speakers. And thank you once again for the invitation. So our talk today, as you well put it, Valentina, will be focusing on our work a little bit at Dama Health, our research um, and the topic of leveraging medicine to personalize contraception and advance female health um, research which is a very important point to all of us here. So just a quick overview of the topics that we will cover in our talk today. We will have a short intro um, to ourselves, but I think we can probably skip that. Um, thank you for, for the intro um, to Dama Health more specifically, and then go deeper and explain what personalized medicine is really all about mm -hmm. and its importance. Um, and then, then I will um, hand it over to my co-founder, um, Dr. Lazerowitz, um, who will go deeper into the topic of personalized female um, care um, and why we should care, no pun intended there. Um, his ongoing research on investigating the pharmacogenomics of contraception and our views on what the future of contraception could look like. So and it, just a brief intro to, oh, to both of us. We are both the co-founders. Um, I am the CEO and Aaron's the CMO. And we have a third co-founder as well, who's a medical student at Imperial, um, who unfortunately could not join us um, here today. But a little bit about um, Dama Health. So we are a very early stage startup working with Imperial College London and the University of Colorado, along with a number of accelerator programs and sponsors. Um, we are UK born but have a multidisciplinary founding team based in the UK and the US. The team is made up of medics, scientists, doctors, data scientists, and engineers. Um, and we are all really on this mutual goal to advance the field of women's reproductive health by creating equitable access to precision medicine. Um, we're on a mission to solve this by targeting the trial and error process um, of contraception. And how do we do this? Well, we are interested in investigating novel biomarkers, genetics, personal experiences, and demographic differences um, to tailor treatment to women's needs so that um, safe, informed contraception decisions uh, can be made. We have therefore developed um, bespoke screening tests, both digital and genetic, which combined can give women and doctors personalized recommendations by identifying risks and tailoring to women's preferences and past experience. Our digital screening test will match you to the best form of contraception based on our proprietary algorithm um, developed by specialists in the field, such as Aaron, um, Dr. Aaron. And our genetic test can refine those contraception recommendations based on any identified risks um, or identifies metabolic differences that we identify. And then all of this information is then combined and available in your profile and to export as an insights report. So precision medicine is a term that a lot of us in healthcare um, are hearing as of late and something we can talk about. We talk a lot about here at Dama Health as well. So what do we mean by precision medicine? Um, well, precision medicine can mean a lot of things and looking at genetic, such as looking at genetic data, biomarkers, qualitative surveys, quantitative data points, all factors that can come together in a medical model um, that proposes the true customiz customization of healthcare. Um, and effectively, it means aligning medical decisions, treatment and practices and products with individual patient groups instead of this one size fits all model um, approach. 
On a very positive note, with revolutions in genotyping technology, we have the ability to rapidly now and affordably look into the majority of the whole um, genome for almost any patient. And so this brings a lot of promise to the revolution and future of precision medicine going forward, especially tackling the genetic side of things. Um, and some example of this is with the Genomics England's project. So after the successful completion of the 100,000 Genomes project, the largest um, study of its kind worldwide, the um, Genomics England is now interested in genotyping um, 5 million more diverse genomes um, within the UK, which will really um, speed through and help us develop and discover actionable insights in medicine, which is all really exciting. But unfortunately, personalized medicine research in women's health is still in its infancy, um, and there are many barriers that need to be overcome to make it a reality for women around the world. As an example, um, poor genomic data diversity is a long-standing challenge, which is a contributing factor to some of the gaps in women's medical research to date. However, we know this now, and therefore we have the responsibility as companies, research groups, institutions to be more effective across the genomics and health data community in recognizing and communicating such problems and assert, essentially working um, towards improving diversity in genomics, um, among other areas of precision medicine. But why is precision medicine important to female health? Well, it's important to everyone, but as we all are quite aware, gender health equity is a prime reason for why it takes women a lot longer um, to be diagnosed from many types of um, disorders and, and medical conditions, and not to even mention how long it can take some women to get a diagnosis of um, disorders such as PCOS, endometriosis, um, among other specific conditions which have been understudied as well. So for starters, precision medicine will allow us to collect useful information and data sets um, required to improve this early detection of patients at risk and therefore guide us to improve prevent preventative measures. It will help us accelerate disease diagnosing, um, enabling and improving individualized treatment strategies. It will help us reduce and prevent unnecessary side effects by understanding our patients' needs better um, and their biology. biology. Um, it will improve outcomes through targeted treatments and essentially, and most importantly, it will help bring us one step closer to health equity um, in female health in medicine. So on that note, I will pass it over to Dr. Lazaritz to um, tell you a little bit more about what we can learn and do with this information to improve medical outcomes. Great. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, everybody, for your flexibility. I appreciate um, letting us go a little early. So. You know, Elena did a great summary of what personalized precision medicine is. And, you know, I think what I wanted to highlight is that, you know, the the basic exclusion of female health from personalized and precision medicine thus far. So there's an organization called the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium. So this is an uh, organization in the States, but there's also several worldwide that kind of come up with the same guidelines. They all crosstalk. Um, basically, they decide, okay, what has enough evidence to say we can use this genetic finding to change prescription practices for a specific drug? Um, because that's where we're at now. We can actually start making clinical guidelines. So they have about 26 published guidelines for 35 drug gene pairs. But if you look at what are actually applicable to female health, there's only two. That's CYP2D6 and tamoxifen and CYP2C9 and ibuprofen. I mean, ibuprofen is taken by everybody. So that's not really that specific to female health. It just does include females. Um, and some of the others do as well. There's, you know, clopidogrel for heart disease, things like that. But you notice there's no contraception. There's no progestins. There's no estrogens. There's no hormones. No one has cared so far about medicines that are far more prescribed worldwide um, to half the population um, than most other medicines that we do. And so that is kind of why we say, you know, personalized medicine and female health is in its infancy because it really is, it's because no one's really paid much attention to it. Uh, next slide, Elena, please. Thank you. And so why should we care? It's because the medicines we use aren't perfect by, you know, it, by any means. So you look at the birth control pill, the combined pill. If you take it perfectly every day, it's reported to be 99% effective, right? But that's, 
you know, that's not perfect. And, you know, just looking at the US, that's nine and a half million women a year taking the pill. That's 95,000 unintended pregnancies. And that's if every woman uses it perfectly. And that doesn't happen. Life is life. Things happen. And so that number is obviously far greater. Um, but that's, you know, why are there those 95,000 unintended pregnancies with a medication that we've been using for decades um, and is supposedly really good? That to me is not acceptable. And that's what kind of brought me down this path to figuring out, well, why are we okay with this? Why are we acceptable with these unintended pregnancies with these really bad side effects as well? Uh, next slide, Elena. And so that got me involved in the field of pharmacogenomics. So pharmacogenomics is basically the personalized, personalized medicine with drugs. So saying, what are the genetic differences, the individual differences that affect how drugs work, the side effects that you get, um, and why they don't work for certain people? And so with one of my first studies, I took 350 contraceptive implant users, so Nexplanon users, the autonogestrel implant. Implant, and so what's what's nice about the implant is that it's it goes in the arm. It's it just releases the drug at steady state. It's manufactured so it releases a consistent amount after the first year. So everybody's getting the same drug exposure. But if you look at this graph on the left, this is measuring out the amount of drug in their system by how long they've been using the implant, and the, it's all over the place, right? So people are very different. It's what we call wide inter-individual variability. So you take two people with the same implant for the same amount of time, the amount of drug they're getting exposed to is going to be vastly different. And we don't know why. But that's probably part of the reason why these medications work so differently for different people. And so for this first study, I tried to look at um, single nucleotide variants. So these are single base pair changes in genes and things that made sense. So genes that are involved in the metabolism of hormones, the function, the regulation, things that, you know, trying to use the data that's been done in other areas of medicine to kind of jumpstart this research in women's health. Um, and, you know, I found some interesting things, one of that being CYP3A7. So this is an interesting gene that is normally not functional in most adults. So it only actually works um, in the fetal stage of life. But individuals with the STAR1C variant in this gene keep making it and they make extra, basically extra enzymes. So these extra enzymes then break down hormones faster than other people. And so in the group that had this variant, their levels were significantly lower than other individuals. So maybe this is some explanation of why some people have lower levels. But the more important thing was that in these high yield targets, I didn't find what I thought I was gonna find really. I didn't find the holy grail of like, this is the answer, this is what we need to look at. And so it just showed, you know, it kind of showed me how far behind we are in our understanding of how these hormones work and what actually affects these big differences between individuals. Uh, next slide, Lena. And also, more importantly, some maybe even is the side effect differences, uh, because as you know, we've already heard, you know, yes, we can talk about like this percent of people have this side effect with this method, but are you going to have that side effect? Is she going to have that side effect? You know, who's going to have each individual side effect? We know there's a wide range but we have no means to predict who's gonna have any specific side effects. And so, you know, with this original cohort, I also found some interesting findings that individuals who had um, higher levels of the hormone level in their concentration were more likely to say they had abnormal bleeding. And so that's the first time anybody's ever shown that a higher level of the progestin hormone was associated with a side effect. Uh, being the first is great, but it also means I can't say definitively that that's the case. I need to prove it again. Other people need to prove it again. We're just so you know early in this research that everything is interesting, but we've got to get better and kind of get re and repeat this information so that we can kind of come up with definitive recommendations on how we can improve things. And that you know because these side effects lead to dissatisfaction, early discontinuation. You know something crazy I looked at was weight gain um, and weight changes in these implant users and found a variant in uh, an ESR gene, which is the estrogen receptor gene, that individuals with two copies of this variant gained so much more weight than everybody else. 
such such the point that it was a you know it was I'm trying to remember the exact amount uh, I think the median was about five kilograms but on the average was like 14 kilograms over the period of time of use and what's interesting is you know if you look at the literature about implant use and weight gain it you know the literature says eh it's a little bit but not really but that's missing the point is that yes for the average it's a little bit but there are people who use the implant and gain a lot of weight and again maybe it's these genetic variants these individual differences that cause people to have much more severe side effects so can we make a tool to predict that you know if we could screen you and say hey if you use the implant you're at you may get a lot more weight gain than this other individual. Would that change your preference? Would that change what you want to use? Because right now it's just a trial and error method, right? You just go, go to your physician, get a method, try it, see what happens, see what terrible side effects you have, and then try a different one and keep trying to get, that's why, you know, individuals have to go to two to three different methods before they even find something that works somewhat well for them. But even still, as was pointing out, one in three women don't like the method they're on, and I think we can do better. Uh, next slide. And that is where I see the future and where Dama Health sees the future of contraception, <clears throat> sorry, is that we can use precision medicine techniques to personalize contraception. Basically taking the medical history, the personal pref preferences, and then the genetics is gonna be the really revolutionary part to provide more individualized counseling on risk of contraceptive failure and risks of side effects. Because really we want higher satisfaction, which leads to higher continuation rates, leading to fewer side effects and fewer unintended pregnancies. And basically just trying to make the system a little bit better from what it currently is, where there is no personalization of contraception. And again, you know, you know, you talk to, at least in the States where I work, you talk to somebody about what pill do you prescribe? Everybody just has their favorite pill, but not all pills are the same and not all people are the same. And that's, you know, this one size fits all model is not the way we should be approaching this problem. Next slide. And so that's Dama Health's vision is to become the future of contraception where we can provide personalized medicine recommendations, not just for contraception, but also then expanding into other areas of female health. Um, there's also tons of potential for other novel biomarkers. So people talk about like, could your hormones predict what birth control is gonna work for you? If you ask me right now, no. We have no idea what any of that data means, what any of that means at all, but there is potential. The issue is, is that we've talked about these big biobanks, like the NHS biobank, things like that. They have not paid attention to this problem. And so, yes, they have millions of people with millions of genetic data, but they don't have the other data we need. They don't have who failed a contraceptive, who had this awful side effect, because you know, they just don't, haven't cared about that data. If you don't have that data of interest, you can't make meaningful conclusions. And so that's where Dama Health comes into place is that we're going to get that information. In addition to my research here in the States, building out in the UK, this big biobank of data and information to finally real, figure out, in addition to what I'm finding in my research, what are other associations that we can use to help make these recommendations better? And so making it inclusive, incorporating novel contra contraceptive methods for everyone, and then expanding it beyond that, looking at things like PCOS, endometriosis, menopause, fertility. These are all issues in female health that precision medicine just has ignored. You know, we use the same types of drugs for treatment of menopause. And again, it's a one size fits all. You just get a drug and see how it works. We can do better. For, same thing with fertility. We're giving these medications that sometimes just don't work for what they're supposed to do, and we don't know yet why. Next slide. And so the big announcement we have is that we are in beta testing, and so we'd love to get more people involved um, as we really get our algorithm and our tool up and running and ready to start collecting that key information um, and start giving out some recommendations. Because really, you know, the, I got involved with Dama Health because there is this 10 to 15 year gap between research and actual clinical utility and improving lives. And that's not okay. That's not acceptable. Um, I want to speed that up, and Elena wants to speed that up, and that's why we're working with our fantastic team to really get this out there, get this up and running and start using the, you know, the limited data we have to really start trying to make a difference while then building the data we need to make the tool better and better over time. Next slide. 
And so thank you everybody for listening and appreciate the flexibility again. Uh, and I'll try to stick around for a couple minutes to answer questions as well. Um, I think if there aren't any other questions, um, then I think this is a good time to wrap it up. Apologies for running a bit over time. Um, but I think it was a great event and we heard uh, so much about contraception. We really went from, you know, the history all the way to more modern technologies like going through the present and still highlighting some of the major challenges that still uh, are present, such as access, but also how we can be better tailor and personalize contraceptive choices and the importance of data and the value that there is in, in using data in this field. So just a uh, quick reminder is that the Cambridge Reproduction uh, also runs uh, early, early research seminars. These are uh, short talks uh, on various topics. And uh, in the next one that I'll send the link to, uh, they'll talk about um, translational um, science of the mammary gland and also uh, access to abortion and abortion law. Um, and also, an, and a very exciting thing that we'll be doing at the beginning of April is participating to the Cambridge Festival uh, with an event all about reproduction and femtech. So uh, make sure you follow the festival, uh, the Cambridge Festival page, and there will be a program uh, coming up soon, very shortly, and you'll see us there. And it would be great if you wanted to join us for that too. Um, so thank you once again to all of the speakers today and to the audience for all the engagement that we had on the chat and also um, directly in the call. So uh, thanks again and we'll see you at the next one. Mm -hmm.